Man, we're back. <laughs> oh, we man. are back. Like, what do you say in the beginning and, of this thing? Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Because, you know, it kind of caters to whoever's listening. And we don't really know what time it is when you're listening. So, yeah. what's up, guys? And it could be a different day of a different week. So, yeah, we're Welcome. just happy that you're listening. Yeah, we're so happy you're listening. Welcome to the show. And real quick, you know, we can't thank everyone enough that's tuned in our numbers are growing every mm-hmm. week which is great keep telling your friends make sure you go over to our instagram and follow at chasen underscore birdies yeah the website's going to be dropping first week of june potentially yeah potentially t-shirts are in production right now oh, we man. got some swag right next to us uh ready to be sold so once the website's up and going the shop will be uh, going and you can you can purchase some cool gear on there. Yeah, man. And we got the uh, I guess Facebook business page gonna get set up. We gotta figure that uh, out. Yeah, I, I'm not a Facebook user, guys, so we'll just have to figure that one out. But uh, what a day, man! What you got scheduled today, man? A little golf today, eh? Uh, play a little golf today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's about right. I think I'm gonna play with you today. Hockey playoffs are in full action oh, right now. My oh my oh my! What about your boy last night? What happened to him? Oh, man. Troach had a fantastic opportunity to score. And uh, he didn't get up mm. the puck. The puck. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. He didn't get the puck up high enough over the, the goalie. And he had a great opportunity. He looked up to the heavens and thought, I just let that one get away from me. It's kind of like a, a three-foot birdie putt. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you got to make them when you, when you have a chance. Yeah. So they're up. 2-0 in their series. I like the way the team looks. Oh, and the old Penguinos. The Penguinos the are series up. Yeah, 1-1. Man, the series, if you're not even into hockey right now, the series are absolutely insane. They are ripping each other's heads off in every series. I mean, once the whistle blo- blows, it's like grab a dancing partner. Yeah. Touch them. Touch them. Hey, the coolest thing about it, though, is the fans. Seeing that action Dude. again and all Dude, that. Carolina, they were the first game one. The towels were going. People were screaming. And I, I know Vin said that it was absolutely electric. So it's it's great to see. Yeah, And man. it's great to see on the PGA Tour, too, that there's starting to be more fans um, at each event. And we're opening up. We're not all the way open. But yeah. we're opening up slowly but surely. We're closer to... Uh, a little bit more normal normality yeah man it's gonna be a good one with all the majors coming up and you know we we have a good guest today i feel yeah he's a good guest motivational speaker was a heck of a fo- football player yeah for, hell of a football player for, uh the pittsburgh steelers and the chicago bears even though his chicago bear time was short mm-hmm. i tell you i saw him we played out in uh scottsdale and um my man, he he looks good on the golf course, man. He's got like these tight tight fitted pants, a little bit tapered there by the ankle. Merrill looks like he is ready to rip someone's head off on the golf course. I mean, he's still in he's still in impeccable shape. I mean, he is in absolute. So he's in better specimen. shape than me. Oh yeah, muffin top. All right, bud. Like she she called me that once. <laughs> my wife called me a muffin top, my stomach, and you know I I took that a little personal. <laughs> so um, we're we're trying to work on it. A little less bread. A little less bread, a little more protein. Protein, a little less beer, more red wine. Mm-hmm. Maybe you should probably up your cardio a little bit too, bud, in some way. Yeah, I mean, we could do that. So so tell the people who our guest is. You really never said. What yeah, Merrill, Merrill Hodge. Well, uh, hopefully people by now know. Uh, we got Merrill on the podcast today, and a really, really inspiring individual, great motivational speaker and some awesome stories that we've had with him. So we're excited to share this podcast with all of you, and uh, I think let's just roll it in. Yeah, keep yeah. chasing those birdies, everyone. Yep, enjoy the pod. As you all know by now, Chasing Birdies is proud to be partners with Holderness and Born. Check them out online at hbgolf.com. Holderness and Born makes fabulous pieces that help you look good on the course, even if your game is not up to par. 
Check out their new arrivals now for this golf season. Also, head on over to ChasingBirdies.com to get some custom Chasing Birdie gear from Holderness and Born. We'll continue to drop these pieces through every season. That's ChasingBirdies.com and Holderness and Born at HBGolf.com. All right, so we now are transitioning from the country music scene, the NHL scene, and we're moving over to the NFL scene. And uh, this running back played for the Steelers, a well-known in Pittsburgh, legend, and obviously is is a very, very motivating guy to be around. I've had the pleasure to be around him. Uh, Merrill Hodge. Merrill, you there? I'm here. I'm here, gentlemen. Hey, man. Thanks so much. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Yeah, so diving in a little bit here, um, I didn't know you were from Idaho. Oh, yeah. And uh, oh, yeah. got involved out there, you know, and, and end up finding your, your love for, for football, I take it. Well, I can just tell you this. Um, here's, here's the big problem I had when I was in Pittsburgh. Uh, well, when I first got drafted, um, we would, you know, Three Rivers, when you come out of the tunnel, you know, all the fans would be there. Mm-hmm. And I always hear, go, go Hawkeyes, go Hawkeyes, <laughs> go Hawkeyes, go Hawkeyes. And, I, you know, I was like, Hawkeyes. Oh, they think I'm from Iowa. Oh. Like, that's all right. I mean, like, so one day, uh, uh, we're walking out. I can't remember what team, my buddy, one of my buddies, like, he goes, You went to Iowa? Like, no, I, I, I went to Idaho, but I'm, I'm telling you, in, in Pennsylvania, I just don't think they can get past Iowa. I go, they kind of get stuck in Iowa and they just can't go another thousand miles to mm. Idaho. <laughs> it's well, like, yeah, you got to you got to you got to remember, Merrill. They're out in the parking lot of Three Rivers. They're uh, drinking a few icy lights. So, uh, right. I don't blame them. I go when I got drafted by the Steelers. I had to go run downstairs and grab that globe, that that ball, that globe ball that everybody had back in like the the eighties, where you didn't have the internet and you're like spinning that around. I'm like, holy cow, that's over by New York. I'm like, gee, what Christmas. Right. <laughs> So That's I don't blame him for not going to be a, being able to go past Iowa. It's all right. It's well, all right. And, and you had a very impressive uh, college football career at Idaho State. You had an NCAA record of five thousand four hundred fifty-three all-purpose yards with thirty-one touchdowns. I don't care who you are or where you are. That's unbelievable. Well, you know, I actually appreciate. You know, the thing that was probably um, the most, um, uh, which stood out the most with what I did and what I was doing back then, you know, I, one year I almost had a hundred receptions. Uh-huh. I had almost a thousand and a thousand my junior year, um, which was really my best year. I probably should have come out my junior year, but um, back then you didn't do that. Um, yeah, I, I started you, you four, years. Off four years. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, it, it's hard to, you know, play college football for four years and every year get a little better. You know, you're going to have a, a down year, you know, you're usually not going to keep going up, 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 and I'd just come, on off, come off a, a year where I almost caught 100 balls, got 1,000 yards of sheet, uh, rushing. And I don't – actually, I think that's you – no, know, I think that's the first time in Idaho State history that had actually been done, to be honest with you. Then I go to my senior year. My mom died that year, tragically, and so it was just that. a train wreck. Yeah, well, that's, I, I appreciate that. I mean, it was just a train wreck. It was just like everything – Everything that could go wrong in one year went wrong, and uh, right. I didn't have my best year. I didn't have my best year, and but playing four years was an advantage to maybe saying play only one or two, and in, in other colleges. So uh, uh, I got lucky. I mean, I was so very blessed and fortunate. I got the chance, you know, and I went to the right team. And so coming out of college, Idaho State's not a known university. No, you know, nowadays you watch you watch these guys coming out of college. We can watch the combine. You can watch that nowadays and, and know yeah. about these players. So how did the Pittsburgh Steelers find Merrill Hodge in Idaho uh, State? Well, no, actually, I went to the Combine. You know, I went to the Combine. I'm glad they don't have footage from back then because <laughs> it would be – I still say I had the one – I had probably the worst Combine in the history of the Combine. You know, if they had footage back in the day, I could verify that. I had gotten the flu about three days before I leave to the Combine. I lose like 10 pounds. Mm. I spent more time getting notes from my doctors for medication I was on so that it, something wasn't false positive for steroids or something. And because there was a particular um, an antibiotic I was taking that could be misconstrued for that in testing. So I had to have all this documentation. I spent more time getting documentation. I wasn't doing drugs, <laughs> but I wasn't on steroids. <laughs> I was just sick. 
before I went to the combine, and then I I showed up and laid an egg. But <sighs> I went to the combine, and then what happens um, after the combine in traditional years is they'll come back and rescout you, you know, and do a pro day. And um, I had been projected to go to the Raiders in the fifth round. Wow. And the Green Bay Packers. So here's the team that came back to um, scout me out or work me out again was the Green Bay Packers, the Washington Redskins, the Raiders, the Denver Broncos, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm. Of all those teams, every one of them worked me out again. Every one of them did drills on me. And the Steelers, um, let me back up a little bit. They give you the day they're going to come in. So they'll say, listen, next Tuesday we'll be in there, meet you in the, at the football office at 1 o'clock. You know, probably get on the field by 2 o'clock. So the Steelers have set the time. I get down there. That I'm going, where's he at? And he goes, well, he's down in the office watching tape. I go down to the room. He's watching tape. And I ask him, hey, listen, do you want me to get ready? And I don't know what time you want to go on the field. And he's like, oh. He goes, hey, well, do you play basketball? I'm like, uh, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I used to play basketball. I was actually really pretty, I was actually really good in basketball. And he goes, he goes, oh, good. He goes, cause, um, the Steelers have a basketball team in the off season. They tour a lot. They, you know, you make some money in the off season, some good money too. You play a lot of games. Basketball. Really? Yeah. So I said, okay. I go, do you want me to go get ready to work out? He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I don't, we don't need that. He goes, I'm, he goes, I, I got all I need right here. So he's watching tape, right? <laughs> And so he said, hey, Tessie, thanks for coming back. You know, we talked a little longer, but I'm just shook his hand. Really nice guy, right? But he doesn't want me to work out. So I leave. I remember going, okay. The pit, of all the teams, I go, I can tell you the one team that ain't drafted me is the Pittsburgh Steelers because they say, they talk to me more about basketball than they did football. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they're not going to draft me. And then, oh, lo and behold, that's who drafts me. That's who drafts you. And <laughs> that's uh, awesome. we were happy to have you. I mean, they draft you 10th round, 261st pick from 87 to 93. I mean, for people that don't know the Pittsburgh Steeler tradition, it is uh, one of sacred ground. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's unbelievable the, the history of the Pittsburgh mm-hmm. Steelers. And for you to actually be a part of that, yeah, you know people are, are, are on the sidelines and all that, but you are actually a part of that history. Tell us a little bit about that because, like I said, it's a – it's a working man city, and it carried yeah. over to those fans. Mm-hmm. Well, I said I got, I, I went to the right city. I went to the right culture mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember going back to combine and the draft. I remember in the uh, evaluation process, I was the third best fullback in the country. Um, I was ranked in the third best fullback. And, that, and, that, and talent is like beauty. It's all in the eye of the beholder. Okay. So, but I'm just in the rankings. I was the third best. Remember the first one was um, Alonzo Highsmith, who was out of Miami. And it read, his bio read something like, I mean, big horse, athletic, <laughs> powerful, catches. You know I mean, just like just an animal. Giant. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then Roger Vick out of Texas a and thoroughbred of a back, big, strong, worse. And it gets to me, self-made player. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, I'm sitting there going, oh, man. I mean, I, that's it. That's all you can write about. And then I, I start thinking about it. I start thinking about it. And this actually should give everybody hope, and I, which is why I do a lot of motivational speaking now. Because quite honestly, I looked at it wrong. I actually, when I, the mark, I spent time thinking about it, I'm like, well, you know what? I, I, I kind of am. I mean, but. And we all have that. We have true. Everybody has that possibility to make the most out of what they have, and that's a, a responsibility that we all have. And so I, I looked at it wrong initially. It took me a while actually, because I keep going back and reading it and just going, "Why can't you be a little more elaborate on on my skills, yeah, than the other skills?" But when I was a kid, my favorite team was the Pittsburgh Steelers. So I, I mean, I was a I was a huge Steeler fan when right I was out a the kid. gate, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, it's like a childhood dream. So I get drafted, and this is like you can't even you can't script this. But they walk me into the locker room, they sit me down in my locker, and the first guy, Tony Priesty, who's the equipment manager, came over and goes, "You, whose locker this is?" And I was like, uh, "Nope." I go, "Well, I guess it's mine." He's like, uh, "That you know, used to be Franco Harris." Oh. And I was like, Ooh. "And who, who who comes walking in and sits down in the locker next to me? Donnie Shell." That's oh my here. God! About ten minutes later, here comes Joe Green. I swear to you, I say oh. he has a can in his hand. I don't realize it's a Coke until he sits it down because his hands are just so massive. You see Joe Green, 
uh, so the kid, kid, I call him, like, you, this is so surreal. I'm like, as a kid, I'm in mean, the greatest commercial in the history of commercial. Coca-Cola. And he's, and he's standing, you know, a coconut smile. And now Joe Green standing, you know, like mm-hmm. 10 feet from me. Uh, oh. Mike Webster was my roommate. My oh, wow. Yeah. John Stallworth was still there. So when I got in the huddle my very first time, I'm looking at Mike Webster and John Stallworth. And I, uh, I mean, obviously Chuck Knoll. Yeah, head coach and and John Kolb was a strength and conditioning coach who was a legendary left tackle for the Steelers. And I, your quarterback was you had Bobby Brister and Neil O'Donnell. No, when I my rookie year it was Mark Malone. Okay, Mark Malone, and then you went into Mark Bobby. Malone was my first year. Yeah, then Bob, then they traded Mark, and uh, and Bobby became our starter. But it was the right. Uh, I fit. I, I remember this is how I knew I had a chance. Chuck Noll gave this. Uh, we were they're going to do a mini combine. Okay, let's go back to the combine. Okay, I already told you how bad it was, right? So mm-hmm. this is what they're going to do the very first day of training camp. And I'm just in my head, just going, "Come on, man! I just can't <laughs> shake this combine thing. I like, I hate the combine. I hate the combine. Uh-huh. I'm not a forty. I, I'm not a sprinter. And that's kind of how I always felt the combine. That's all they looked at. But I, the agility drills I was, is where I really I would separate myself from other people because I could start and stop, and I had great change of direction. Which, as I learned later on in life, I mean, really in football, that's one of the best things to have, that gift of start and stop and redirect. Now, if you have that and rare speed, then, you know, you, you have a chance to really be elite. But if you wanted to pick one of the two and to be a good football player, like a wide receiver, Jerry Rice wrote a four six forty. Mm-hmm. But what he did so well is he got in and out of break. He was mm-hmm. so great with his route running. And that's true with – Football, getting in and out of breaks, change direction. Rather, D lineman, right? Your outside linebacker, DB, wide receiver, running back. You know, even the quarterback. I mean, really, it's about feet, hips, and arm. You know, that's all. That's how it works. So, he said, "Hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're to find out who's the fastest and who jumps the highest." And he was really making a joke of it because he didn't want to do it. He kind of got forced to do it because he shared it with us. He goes, "I really don't want to do this. It's going to waste a, pra- a day of practice. We're going to do something we've already done." And he threw a caveat out there. He made everybody wear pads and dress like you were playing. You had to be taped. And he said, he goes, uh, I want your socks down. Um, I want knee pads in. I want your butt pad in, too. Everything had to be on. Oh, wow. So if you didn't work taped, it made you go back up and get taped. So the fastest 40, remember, Rod Woodson was was in my draft. He was a world-class sprinter. Rod Woodson was the fastest. It was him or Dwight Stone. They ran the fastest 40, like a 4.65. Because we ran it on grass, too. We had full pads. We had grass on it. So if you said Rod Woodson ran a 4.65, four, you'd five. be like, you're yeah. like, are you kidding me, yeah. Rod Woodson? But, but now you, you go to the real environment. In the draft, it, you got spandex and underwear. It's uh-huh. an athletic event. You know, like I tell people, if you really want, if, if, if it was just about speed, then you should go to the Olympic trials, and grab everybody who doesn't make it to the Olympics because all of them are world class sprinters. It's yeah. like a football player. I go, it was just that easy. But he says, we're going to do all this, we're going to do it. And he goes, and then I'm going to spend the next five weeks finding out who can play football. Wow. And like when he said that, I was like, okay, I got a shot. I got right, a shot. Right. I go, if I could just get, if I just get through today, You're whatever good. I do, just get through it and just then show him for five weeks that I can play football. And that's, that was the start um, when he said that. And I was able to do that. I had a, uh, had a really good training camp. That was the year we went to we went out to strike though after our second game, which was tragic, just absolutely tragic. You can make a team, and then I'm I'm walking out. I'm like, what? It's yeah, what's happening? Sense, We're done. You know, it's just, yeah, it was '87. Was a rough year, a real rough year, rough year. So playing, playing, getting your first kind of taste of the NFL. You know, you're coming out, and you have you're you're with this team that's coached by Chuck Noll. He's a legend. Uh, you're surrounded by the likes of, you know, like you said, uh, Joe Green and, and whatnot. Was there an intimidation factor for you to perform at a certain level out the gate, or were you just kind of always betting on yourself and knowing that, hey, the biosynopsis of me in the draft is true, and I'm going to prove it. Like, I'm betting on me. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting question because, and this is where I – I thrived in. I'm telling you this, that uh-huh. the better the player, the bigger the game, the better the team, the better I played. Yep. It's like I welcome I welcome yep. that. I never um like I'm gonna tell you this, like I, third and five, mm-hmm. I've always went in the huddle 
or I've always went to the sideline where I was basketball or baseball. I'm like, gosh, dang it. But maybe I want to be there when it's full count bases loaded. Yep. You want to like, you put me in that position, man. And I always pre- prepared like that in my head. I always thought like that in my head. And I hit the home run or I, well, I hit the shot to win at basketball. I make the winning shot. Uh, football on third and one, fourth and one. I go, give me the ball. I get the Yeah. Ball. Give me the ball. Now, what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at, <clears throat> see, and I think that, like you, you, you talk about, like, how do some people perform? In those critical junctures, I do often, I do think that there's a large thing that plays on your approach to those environments, those approach to those moments m- mentally. Like I never thought I would not get it. Now, there are plenty of games where I didn't get it. Yeah, but I, yeah. I never thought like that. Right. I, 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 never, I never thought like that. I remember when I first got to our first mini camp, I was like, holy cow, this is awesome, man. Michigan's over there. Florida's over there. Clemson's over there. I'm like, well, Georgia's over there. Mm. Like I'm playing mm. these guys. Yeah. I'm playing because these guys. I go, you know, I can and so I, I like that. I really did. Uh I it, it brought the best out in me. Um yeah. and I and I and I got to see, you know, something I got to see something about myself because I you know, in those moments you just sometimes maybe you don't know how you're going to respond. Um and I just do think it goes back to how you'd always kinda programmed yourself. How do you yeah. think of 100%. Things in those moments, you know, I never thought of failing, and that doesn't mean that. Uh, and I don't even. I remember the Denver Bronco game was probably it was a playoff game in '89. We had uh, where we lost, where we done everything <laughs> to win that game, but we end up losing it. But I, I've never been in a game where, from the start of the game to the end of the game, the intensity of it, and the moments where you have butterflies and the pressure of every down and that's probably because like ever like it seemed like every third down we had this play called um, 99 full, fullback option where everybody ran go routes and then i would run an option route underneath they'd really they try to really clear the field out and let me win and that's all we called like every third down that's what we called and i and the more i and then when i started i got all the first i was getting all the first downs in the first half so they doubled me in the second half so they just put another so layer done. of right. complication, and, and I'd want to—I know—and I beat him then. Oh, um, Dennis Smith and uh, and Steve Atwater. In fact, for the two safeties, Steve Atwater and I still talk about this game every when I see him every now and then because there's a Sports Illustrated cover shot. I'm running over Steve Atwater. Oh my god! And it's uh, it, it's either the, the cover <laughs> or it's the, the lead, the picture in the in the in the article in the magazine. Uh, but we we had this play called 16U. We put it in that week. I hated it. It was just a bad angle. It was a, it was a, it was, I hated it when I came. I like when we put it in. I was like, I, I hate this. Oh. Well, it's like third. It's like third and and forever. And we're backed up on the five yard line. We've already done a false start. It's we're just then the crowd's going ballistic. I mean, it's so loud. You can't. And here, in comes sixteen. You. I'm like, are you freaking <laughs> kidding me? And I take it and I. I ended up getting about 49 yards on the run, wow. yeah. but it was that run that I was, I ran over Steve, Steve Atwater. Steve Atwater took it. And, yeah. And see, but we, we laughed because, and this is why we laugh about it. Cause you'll remember Steve Atwater. Steve Atwater's probably remember for hitting Christian Okoye, right? Yeah. On a Monday night uh-huh. game. I mean, like decleating Christian Okoye. Okay. It's just, it's, it's just, it's not, Oh, I ran over Steve Atwater. That's not what I'm saying. It's, at some point, I don't care who you are or how bad you are. It ain't gonna go your way. <laughs> there's just too yeah. many. There's because I can show you but many times I got depleted it was on the other end of it. But we laughed like that. Doesn't matter who you are. Events if you play long enough, yeah. somebody's it's, gonna get you. Yeah, you, somebody's gonna get you at some point. Well, and, and that's the thing. You know, at that time you're a younger player, and them the Steelers keep giving you the ball. That gives you all the confidence in the world. Yeah, because okay, they're trusting me. When you have confidence and you're a professional athlete, I don't know that, but. From what I've heard, you... He looks nobody, like a professional athlete, yeah, though, bud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my wife told me I had a muffin top yesterday, so... Yeah. Uh, uh, but you have the confidence, and, and nobody's going to stop you. And that's always nice to, nice to have whenever your, your team's relying on you. There's, a, there's a, a silver lining in there where coaching is so important, you know, because mistakes can happen. I remember... Um, it was when Bill Cowher first came in. Ron Earhart came in. He was offense coordinator for the New York Giants when they won the Super Bowl. He now he's a fabulous coach, but he and I butted heads the Ooh. second he the second he entered 
the building, and this is why he wanted to cut me and bring Maurice Carthon in because he wanted a guy who just was a glorified guard. He uh-huh. all, all, all Maurice Carthon did. Maurice Carthon, very good football player, uh-huh. but he just blocked. He, they never gave him the ball. He didn't catch. And I was our third down back. Um, I, I carried the ball a lot. I mean, I did a a whole host of things. And and Bill's like, you know, you, you know, between Mr. Rooney and that guy over there, he pointed to Bill Cower. They ain't gonna let me get the guy I want in here. And I'm like, well, oh. think about this. I just so I said, well, and now listen, here's what I believe about respect. And I had respect initially. I don't believe that, you know, you have to respect your coaches or elders if they're going to disrespect you. Now, I never disrespected a coach or anybody in my life unless I had been so disrespected. Uh-huh. I had to I had to defend myself and I had to really stand up for myself because he just kept beating me down. He beat me down. Um, I made I had a couple balls where I dropped. Oh, my gosh. Every day he would talk about, you know what, you want one more of those? He goes, no, I'm going to get my wish. I'm going to get you out of here. And I was wow. like, and he's wearing on me and wearing on me. So, you know, one day I was fine. I said, well, listen, I go, you're such a brilliant, you're such a genius. I go, I led, led the team in rushing and receiving four out of five years. And you're so smart that you can't incorporate somebody like me in your offense and get me the ball and have another phase to your offense. Like, well, that actually speaks volumes about you. Oh, yeah. I go, you can't find ways. I, now, and these were direct. I mean, we had verbal confrontations. I mean, almost daily. I mean, weekly. I mean, it's very practical. So we play the Patriots. Um, Bill Parcells is on the other side. Um, Barry Foster had got hurt. This is second, the second year into Bill Cower. And um, Barry Foster got hurt. He headed back home to Dallas. And I, I became our feature ball carrier. Well, I have a big game against the Patriots. I had like three touchdowns, and 100 yards rushing, like 70 receiving. And uh, Bill Parcells comes across the field and tells Ron Earhart, he goes, oh, that's a heck of a football player. Mm. That's a heck of football. Now, now, see, here's what I loved about Ron Earhart. I still go back. He's a great coach. It's just because he and I didn't see head to head. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest and fair. He was. I learned a lot from Ron Earhart. He was a great coach. He and I. He just wanted to get his buddy in yeah. there, and we butted heads with that. But he comes back to me. He's like, you know what? He goes. He tells. He tells me. Decides. That's how I know this because he tells me what happened. He changed his perspective of me. Mm. But what I'm getting to is he had beat me down so long. I mean, I told you, I don't, I think I have, I might still have the record for most receptions by running back in NCAA history. I still might have that. Okay. When the ball was thrown to me, I was like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I felt like I had three left hands or a no yeah. finger. I, I was like, I was scared to death for the ball to come to me. It was like, I couldn't catch the ball because he had beat me down so much that my confidence was just shattered and it really took, I mean, it was an arduous battle to get that confidence back. That helped, you know, once he started getting off me and then he, he, cause he respected Bill Parcell so much. He just looked at me differently. And then our conversations changed. I remember when I was, um, that was the year I became a free agent. And I remember Bill, uh, Ron Earhart called me into his office and he said, here's what our plan is. Here's I'm going to move you and Barry in the backfield together. He goes, we're going to feature both you guys. We're going to draft a fullback and make you guys our ball carriers. And I just, when I walked out of the room, I was like, man, I just don't believe it. You know, I just, just because I just, even though things had changed a little bit, I just didn't believe it. And the 49ers had tried to trade for me both years because they knew that I, I didn't fit what they were doing. Technically, I really didn't, but I did fit in San Francisco. And we had played in Spain a year ago and the 49ers fell in love with me and wanted me because Maurice Carr, they wanted to get Tom Rathman because Tom Rath, they wanted a little more versatility as a runner and they wanted to bring me in. And so, but the Steelers wouldn't trade me because they wanted two defensive linemen for me. And that really wasn't a fair trade. I just, that's to be honest with them. I, mean, I told Tom Donald, I go, why don't you just, I mean, make it fair. Get me out of here. Yeah. You know, I don't fit here. To, I go, you, yeah, you keep asking for too much. Nobody's going to trade for that. They're not going to trade me for me for that. You're making this too hard. And so I knew in the free agency that, that that's probably where I was going to go. And then the Bears called out of the blue. And they just signed Cameron Hayward. I mean, uh, not Cameron Hayward, uh, Ironhead Hayward mm. the year before. And I was like, why would they want me? But again, that's that was the time when the fullback was used a lot more. And they, they But they wanted versatility with that guy. Yeah. And I brought versatility. I brought versatility to him. And that's what the Bears wanted. They wanted versatility. 
So cool. when you left Pittsburgh, were you kind of okay with it? Like, hey, this is my time to go. No, I, I'm the worst negotiator in negotiating history. <laughs> now this is this is this is what happens. I go to the San Francisco 49ers. I meet with George Seaford, Carmen Policy, who's the GM. Carmen Policy said, "You're the best fullback in this league." He goes, "When we want to sign," he goes, "But." Right now, we don't have enough money. Now, this is just about the second year or first year the salary cap has been introduced. The 49ers have $2,000 under the salary cap. They don't have enough money to even run mini camp. <laughs> it's going to take them till the draft to get enough money. Now, this is a year they signed Deion Sanders, Ricky Sanders, he's the line the backer for the Saints. And they give everybody kind of the same deal. If we win the Super Bowl, which they do, everybody gets a million-dollar signing bonus. Awesome. And Mike Shanahan was the offensive coordinator. Mike Shanahan works me out, and they kiss. And I met with George Seifert, and he's like, "Well, you know, man, if this is back in the day, I just ask you how much, and you're a 49er. <laughs> I start crying. I'm like, "No, oh. no, why?" <laughs> and I make one mistake. Mike Shanahan says, "Hey, listen, don't sign anywhere. At least call me before you do." So I flew back actually to the Bahamas because I had flown from the Bahamas to go meet with them. I'd already been with the Bears. The Bears offer me about roughly a million dollars to sign and a million a year for three years. Okay, that's that's a million dollars a year. When I got in the league, the highest paid player in the National Football League was Walter Payton at a million dollars. Wow. And I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm as good as Walter Payton. What I'm saying is could you imagine what Walter Payton would have been worth right. that time? Yeah. And just, and just how much things had grown in almost uh -huh. 10 years. Yeah. It's just like today when I look at these contracts, I'm like, oh, oh, it's ridiculous. oh my gosh. But you can't do anything about that. You just, you know, listen, before me, they probably did the same thing. Walter Payton was probably like, oh, man. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. know what I'll be worth? And he'd be right. Okay, mm -hmm. so now the Bears offer me a million to sign and a million a year. So you have to take so it. I just play. Well, well, let's wait. This is, this is where the bad negotiating comes in. I... I'm going. I went down to. I was working out at W and J, working in the pool. I did. I was doing a pool routine. I, I I spent a lot of time in the pool when the season was over to rehab and recover, and a lot of my training. The Steelers said I'd just come off a five hundred thousand dollar deal, and now I'm getting double. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, and Tom Donald kept saying, he "Goes, gosh, if you bring me, you bring me a deal." He goes, "Maybe you know, maybe we'll, we'll start talking." So I drive and W and J. I come to him. I take him the deal. I go, hey, "Listen." Here's what I'm getting. I'm getting a million a year and a million to sign. I go, I'll come. I'd rather stay here for eight to sign and eight a year. So I take 800000 off the books right oh. there for myself. I lose I, I lose $800,000 oh. right off the bat in my negotiations, right? And that's yeah. when that's when he said, oh, he said, I don't need you. I got Barry Foster. Oh, man. And the year before, Barry had left the team. He quit the team because he hurt his ankle and he said, I can't play. I can't do anything more for it. So he just leaves. And I, that was the, the year that when Bill Parcells had told yeah. Warren Earhart that, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, you're going to trust the guy just ran out on the team. And I, I it was like, he was got getting sucker punched. He was like getting punched right in the gut. I yeah. remember walking out. I remember walking out of three rivers. Okay. I made a decision, an irrational decision from motion. Okay. I go back to what is, uh, Mike Shanahan say, just give me a call. I yeah. didn't make that call. I called. I called my agent and I said, "Brother, I'm a bear," <laughs> and um, <laughs> drove home. Well, wow. and um, and I was angry. I would say I was angry, and then, thank goodness I had cooler heads prevailed because I'm like, I was only angry at Tom Donahoe. Yeah, how he handled it. Say, I'm like, the Steelers drafted me and gave me a chance, and I have had nothing but absolute joy and success there. And thank the Lord, I just let that happen. That yeah. be that'd be my focus because every, all the media hit me up just within an hour. And I said exactly what I should have said. And I really felt genuinely, I didn't let that, that anger for one person um, make say something that I would have regretted. And the reason I, I say that is the next morning the, my phone rang and it was Mr. Rooney. He said, Hey, um, can you come down to my office? And so I'm thinking, hey, I haven't signed that deal yet. Maybe I'll get yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's how I'm thinking. I'm like, oh, this is, oh shoot, I'll get down. And so I get down to Mr. Rooney, and I, I said, I haven't signed the contract. He goes, oh, he goes, like, you can't do that. Which he was right. I couldn't do that, right? But he yeah. said, I just want you to know something. He goes, um, he goes, I pay people to do their job. He goes, um, I never said this publicly. He goes, but I wish I would have kind of 
done a little differently. He goes, but I want you to know you are welcome in those to walk in those doors anytime you want. Awesome. And I remember like he was saying that I was like, okay, that was all worth it. As much as I wanted to stay there, it was mm-hmm. so hard to leave. I'm telling you, I walked out. I was crushed. Actually, I was so crushed because it's where I wanted to be. But uh, that gives you that chills when a guy like Mr. Rooney tells you that. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I was like, okay. And I'd go back to, okay, just, I'm glad I didn't just let a little bit of emotion get a hold, get a, take me away and start bad mouthing about all these people when none of them had anything to do with them, ripping an organization that didn't have anything to do with this. It was just one. I, I was just like, thank goodness I had that common sense not to do that. But that's how I ended up in Chicago. I ended up in Chicago. And now Walter Payton was my favorite player. So I, I, it, there was a lot of great things that happened in Chicago. And I learned so much. And the experience was, uh, you know, still lives me today. Some of the great relationships and friends and, and what I what I developed in Chicago. I, You know, I wouldn't have had some opportunities I had in Chicago that I, that I wouldn't have had them in Pittsburgh that I had in Chicago. Like right. when I signed my deal there, part of my deal was doing a – a Monday night show on my, at Walter Payton's place, a radio show for two hours. It was my radio show. I did a pregame show for CBS and a postgame show for CBS, which I was trying to work in broadcasting anyway. And there just wasn't those type of flat platforms in Pittsburgh. There are more of those in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And so I got to do a lot of things and meet a lot of people on that side. And when my career prematurely ends, it just, it was a good thing I had done that because yeah. it really helped me transition into my life's work. Yeah. yeah. No, and and you know you've battled you know, uh, you know some concussions uh, in your career, yeah. And so I think being able to have the opportunity and see that hey, at the end of your football career, you've kind of set yourself up to be successful again, betting on yourself to transition into this. Uh, you know, I don't want to say career, but essentially a, a different career than what you were used to. And now, you know, looking at it from here and backwards it it's it's been a good move for you in terms of you know your 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 speaking your media career and whatnot um you know that might have been a a a reason why you propelled into that uh into that career by being traded to chicago yeah well i you know i I go back you you can't everyone wants to try well if you change one thing what can you change well you know you can't nobody can change anything so why, why even think about why it? Waste, right. Why waste? Well, why waste that energy? You know, I've never, yep. I've never played that game because you always lose that game because mm-hmm. it's an unrealistic game. Um, I can, I can tell you this that you know, I wrote a book. My the first book I wrote was the title is Find a Way, and Find a Way. Those words have helped me live a dream and fight to live. Mm-hmm. They started when I was age twelve. It's the first time I ever had my own bedroom, and I. I had my dad, dad make me a wall of cork. Hmm. On that wall of cork, I put up my goals. And that the top of the goal was I will play in the National Football League. Hmm. And um, I remember as a kid, when I was younger, people would always say, hey, what are you going to do? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to play in the National Football League. One of four things was always said to me right after I told them what I was going to do. The people who were supposed to encourage me were the first ones to discourage me. They'd say, oh, you know how hard that is? Oh, hmm. Merrill, you know, God, you play in the NFL? Are? Oh, hmm. my son, don't put all your eggs in one basket. I wouldn't want you to be disappointed or it was impossible. Hmm. Well, when I put that goal up, I will play in the National Football League. It's the first exercise I ever had in my life where do you control your mind or does your mind control you? Well, my mind was controlling me. I, everything I thought about was how hard it was going to be or the odds. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. It's impossible. And the words find a way popped into my head and they, it, it changed my thought process. I mean, it inspired the one thing I always talk about when I speak is it inspired action. Yeah. But what it did, it was my first exercise of me now controlling my mind. So I remember I take my goals down, I move them down an eight by 10 card and I put the words find a way at the top because it inspired me every day to take action. Action ultimately resulted in a plan. You create a plan. And then you execute that every day. I, was, I tell a story about what Walter Payton did for me and the thing I learned from Walter Payton. But it was that moment in my life that I didn't realize he was supposed to help me live a dream. I didn't know that it was going to be, it was going to implement when I got diagnosed with cancer, when I had open heart surgery, when my career ended, I'm in depression. 
I can't even read a child's book. I mean, I have all of this rehab to do. And those words have inspired me. And I got tools now where I control my mind. I don't let my mind control me. And I have a bunch of different ways that I go about doing that, um, being accountable, yep. you know, um, taking action. You know, I, 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 try to, I also, when I talk, I talk about, okay, listen, there, there's really two kind of locker rooms you can get up and get dressed in every day. It's really up to you. And if you want to be in a toxic quitter locker room, you're probably pointing fingers, making excuses, and casting blame. I've never seen a successful person or a champion walk out of a locker room like that. I've never seen it done. And I will never see it done right. because it is toxic, it is poisonous, and it is weak. And nobody goes anywhere. Successful locker rooms, and I have done this, and it's been great value in not just playing football for all these years, but to go speaking and seeing all of these different environments and talking to people and mingling with a, a multitude of businesses and people. The one thing that I find in all successful people is their willingness to self-reflect, mm. that they look at themselves and they evaluate themselves first. Do I got to make changes? If they do, they correct them. Mm. They create a plan and then they take action. And that's where their vision and focus is. And it is, true in every environment i've paid a really close attention to that over time and um i learned it as a young kid um i've had exercises you know not just at age 12 i mean i almost lost my hand a couple years later where there was in a farming accident where um i had to put her on display uh you know when i when i was getting drafted i mean there's many times in that process you know when my career ended in the nfl then when my career ended at espn there's been a whole, so, and I can guarantee you this, this is probably one time that everybody probably dealt with it a little bit in 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's things where everybody could say, boo, I could see how, you know, losing your purpose right. for a little bit or not have, being able to do the things I used. You could feel how, hey, listen, yeah. if I let it go, it could go south on me quick. Very quickly. I mean, right. And, and that part of that, Merrill, is why we named this podcast Chasing Birdies. Not only is it golf. Yeah, we're chasing birdies in golf all the time you're chasing birdies in life too. You, you, you're looking for, if you're a salesman, you're looking for the next big sale. Uh, you're an attorney, you're looking for the next big case. We're all chasing birdies in some capacity. Let's, let's talk about chasing birdies. I mean, you enjoy chasing those birdies, right? <laughs> Listen, I just got done with, uh, I got a great, I, I got a great coach, um, Rod Cook. Rod Cook runs all of the uh, Four Seasons Golf. You got a swing coach? Yeah, he's uh, well. He listen. He's just, he's a great coach. That's why I love him. I, I don't. I mean, I, I see Mike once a year, but what I'm always fascinated with, and here's what I think good coaches do, is they work with, you know, like golf. Okay, would everybody like to have Tiger Woods swing? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, one person that plays golf that wouldn't like wouldn't take that swing. Exactly. Okay. There's one. There's one Tiger Woods. Man, if you break down golf at the end of the day, it all comes down to impact. You know, can you can you impact the ball correctly? when it matters. And he's really good at helping me get to that point. And this, this last time I was with him, um, the things that he, he worked with me on and he's helped me with. I remember I, uh, I went to Isle Worth, speaking of Tiger Woods, mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, where his was. And um, I played there the day before. I was, oh God, I thought I, I did you see, shot let me, 90, let me know. huh? Did you see but, the fire hydrant? Yeah, well, yeah, everybody knows what fire hydrant. Well, if you know them, I mean, when you go out to the, yeah, when you go out to the driving range, you drive yeah. right by. Actually, because <laughs> actually, the, the the guy, okay, this next day after the lesson and how I go about playing, the guy who plays with me, and he bought. Oh, he house. bought the house. So I, he bought that house. So we we go over to we go we went out there for a boat ride over at his house because I'd ask like. My brother was with me. I didn't ask. My brother did. He was like, he goes, I can't tell how many people a day come by and take a picture of that fire hydrant. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny, Merrill? I played with that cat last year at Owlworth with Stuart Appleby. The guy that bought, I'm assuming it's the same guy because he, he lives in the house. Be. His, his, his name's Holly. Yeah, Holly. Yeah, yeah. big tall yeah. guy, you know, you yeah. Know, yeah. Has, yeah. wears a watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, Holly. Yep, played with him. Small world. Anyways, yeah. go ahead. So you shoot 90, what, 90? I forget what you said. No, but. I don't. I think it was about ninety nine. But the next day, so what? What is anyway? Like hundred because I have. Uh, I can't say barely. I uh, I uh, and but listen, I'm, I can't tell how many balls I lost. I mean, I'm always. It's never where it should be. It's not even remotely close. So Rod gets me 
have you ever hung up like it's kind of like a little beach ball from there's a string that hangs from it it kind of helps you with your your hands yep. as they position into the ball my and then he positioned my right hand differently it was too much under the club so i, I would really have a tendency to roll my hand over so that's why i pull it to the left a lot mm-hmm. and um the little sidebar i went i had a two my wife bought me for christmas greatest christmas gift i ever got a two-hour lesson with butch Harmon. oh epic we, i spend all day with butch Harmon. that's that, so awesome I, the second i meet butch I, I fall in love with the guy i mean we had a freaking blast and he is and he, I, he, he when i got sat down he goes you know what i like about you Merrill? i'm like ah, i don't know i didn't know you, I didn't even know you knew me <laughs> other than <laughs> man, I, I got my wife called got you he goes, I like how you're on television. He goes, you just tell it like it is. You have your facts straight. You show the evidence of it. And, and that, cause that's how he was. Uh-huh. You know, that's why people get angry at him. That's why Tiger and him kind of yeah. fell out of love a little bit. Cause he He's was very brutally direct. honest. Yep. So I'm, I, and I'll just tell you how direct. I, I have always had that tendency to hit, pull it to the left. And I'm, I'll get back to how Rod helped me really correct it. It's going to take me a while because you just don't correct it overnight. But the habits and the practice I'm doing is helping it. Bush goes, that's the ugliest shit I've ever seen in golf. <laughs> don't. I don't want to ever see that. I'm like, that's atrocious, Merrill. I'm like, okay, that's why I'm here, Bush. <laughs> I'm like, I get that. That's why. I'm... So he's like, listen. But he, he was great. He's like, this is how you, in golf, this is what I what we want. He goes, I'd rather you push it out to the right because you're so much closer to having a good swing. You know, you're mm-hmm. closer to hitting mm-hmm. it right. Mm-hmm. That hook stuff, get out of here. That's gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's hard to play a golf course with a hook. No, it's, you can't play one. It's, yeah. it's not hard. You can't. So I, I've, I've never forgotten to butch. And I, anyway, it's like I'll text him every now and I'll see him at the Augusta or something. And I'll say, I ah, see you on there. Or just because uh, yeah, he's in Vegas. That's where right. his place is. And yeah. I just, I, I love the guy. I just. Well, he's, I, he's I built a nice love, resume. No, oh, he's, and I can see why he's good. Yeah. Um, but he, um, but the, Rod Cook, the, the, um, uh, the guy who's I, well, I just think it's a fabulous teacher. He knows he just does. It ain't just me. Everybody works with. He works within the framework of that golfer. You know, he's not trying to. Because I've been to lessons before, and I'm like, well, let's look at Tiger Woods on the screen. I'm like, oh, why are we do that? I'm like, why are we doing that? That's not who I want to look at right uh, now. Right. I ain't, that ain't Tiger Woods. I don't want to look at Phil Mickelson. None of them. Okay, I'm not in. I'm not on tour. More okay? like Bubba Watson, where it's a homemade golf yeah. swing. There you go. Anyway, so, but anyway, see, he's been, it's just, it's enormous, it's different. I mean, it's really helped my game. I mean, it's, I've played the last couple of days, I've hit ball, and it's, but it's going to take me obviously several months before I can really patent it and get rid of a, a habit that has been bad. Uh, you're, out, you're out in Arizona right now? No, I know, I'm not in Arizona right okay. now. I'll be, uh, I'm going to end of the end of the month. Okay, yeah, I, man, the golf out there is, is incredible. I mean, there's so many good golf courses out there. Even the average golf course oh. is really good. Yeah, very true. I used to live there. I used to live out at Desert High, a place called Desert Highland. Yeah. You know, and you when you, okay, if you're familiar with it out there, we when we were at the, uh, I'm forgetting where we were at, the Princess or. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah last month. So, yeah, it's up north. Um, it's up from Greyhawk where we were at. Yeah. It's up about, not about 10 minutes maybe uh, well, up north. I tell you, Greyhawk, that was a good track. That was my first time. Yeah, and I, you know, I didn't realize it had two eighteen horses, I yeah. had eighteen whole courses. I did not know that. <laughs> it was my first time there. I saw Mickelson on uh, Instagram or something with his golf bag. He has Greyhawk on a golf bag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I thought he was oh, at really? Whisper Rock. No, he, well, he, he's at yeah. Whisper Rock, but he's I think a partner in Greyhawk. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. They pay the bills. Sense. I got it. I yeah, got Whisper you. Rock's Spon- beautiful too. Oh, Whisper my Rock, gosh. Awesome. That, that's top three for me. That place. Yeah. The views, the course, the hang. Incredible. Yeah, that's what I love about Desert Highlands. Desert Highlands comes out of Pinnacle Peak. A lot of their key boxes come out of the mountains, and it's just spectacular. The views, the, it's just gorgeous. So when you, you know, because you're obviously well-versed in mental toughness, and we all know golf is a game that will just absolutely destroy any mental confidence you have at any given time. Golf does that to you. It humbles you. Yeah. Yeah, if you let it, you know, if you let it, here, that's why, I, here's what I love about it. You you are right. I think it's a great game to exercise being, um, controlling your mind. Okay? So you hit a bad shot. Now, do I say that? Here's what I'll do. Next. If I get down the bad hole, next hole. 
I can't forget. I mean, that hole's done with me. I'm on yep. to the next one. On to the next. I don't think I've ever gotten mad. I just, I mean, you know, there's times when you're like, oh, are you freaking kidding me? When you keep hooking the stuff and, you you know, you get frustrated. But I was like, oh, next one, next swing, next hole. There's nothing next you swing, can do. That's back hole. to what you were saying. There's nothing you can do in the past. Right. Yeah. Now, here's what Rod has done. He, he's given me some tools. When I do hit it wrong, I now I don't know why I'm hitting it wrong. See, some people don't know why they're hitting it wrong. I'd be one of those guys. I didn't know that for years. I'm like, how am I doing this? You know, Butch actually opened my eyes to it. He's like, here's why you're doing it. You know, because they have cameras on the ceiling. They have oh, cameras everywhere. everywhere. Like, you can see your whole swing. And That's awesome. when you understand why you do it, I'm like, ah, okay, now you get that yeah. now. Now I understand it because, you know, golf is very opposite. You know, mm-hmm. when you think you're doing something that causes that, it's the complete opposite of what you're doing. Yeah. You know, which I, which I, uh, which now, I mean, just speaks to the level of com- complexity of the game. You know, it's, it's the opposite of what you think you're doing. Um, yeah. when you hit a ball the wrong way or you hit it, you, when you hit it wrong, you're it's opposite. Sometimes it's very opposite of what you think you're doing. And then, so if you don't know it, you start correcting things you, that you, you don't even know why you're correcting it. You're correcting it the wrong way. Yeah, the wrong way. So you're making your save a bigger mess. Yeah, way worse. So yeah. are, are you over at Cold? Is that Coldstream Country Club? Is that yeah, where you're member? Yeah, Coldstream in, uh, in Ohio. Yeah, Cincinnati. So coming from Pittsburgh, though, I mean, you know, we have absolute stunning courses in, in Southwest PA uh, and oh, North well, Central well, West I Virginia. To, yeah, I belong to Swickley in Pittsburgh. Okay. I belong there for, I mean, and what they've done over the last 10 years, you know, I've yeah. been there probably kind of on or off for 30. Yeah. It's, but it's, that place, it, Neville Wood is gorgeous. I mean, you got Oakmont, Laurel Valley, just in that new Allegheny. I mean, we could go on yeah, and on. Fox about, Chapel, Longview. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all of them. Cause I would say based on that area that we're talking about, if you took this Cincinnati, Kentucky area, I think Pittsburgh would destroy them. In oh my God. Yeah. In that, in that, re, you know, based on that circumference of area. Well, you come down to Morgantown and see your buddy Brian Blankenship, and then we'll go up to uh, Pikewood National, which typically when people come into Pittsburgh, they play Oakmont, then they drive down and play Pikewood, and Pikewood is just second to none, man. It's If you haven't... Let's do it. Yeah. If it's an invite, just consider me... Yeah, well, a, that's an invite. A, a fourth. Consider <laughs> me a fourth. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. So we're going to transition into, uh, I guess here is called the tap-in segment of our show, Merrill. So basically... Jonathan's going to ask you a couple quick hitters and, you know, you just kind of reply on the spot. First thing that comes to your mind. So I'll, I'll give it to you, JP. All right. The tap-in segment is brought to you by 44 Concierge. They're the premier concierge company for professional athletes. Started by current NHL vet Nate Thompson, 44 makes sure that all the moving parts in an athlete's life are organized and handled so you just worry about scoring the winning goal or draining that birdie putt. 44, make sure their athletes enjoy more and worry less. Check them out at 44concierge.com. All right, Merrill, ready? Ready. Antonio Brown or Heinz Ward? He, Heinz Ward. Yeah. That's what we we just talked about. We said Heinz Ward. Uh, the, guy's, the guy's competitor. He's a teammate, uh, but we won't get down that, that rabbit hole. Oakmont Country Club. Well, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's a humbling course. Yes, it is. It's like my buddy Ken Milani he used to be a CEO of Blue Cross, Highmark Blue Cross, Blue Shield in Pittsburgh. He was talking to Tiger Woods, and he just thought he'd throw out. This is when they're playing the, the Masters there. I mean, the uh, Open, um, U.S. Open. Open, open there. And he, he just happened to man, hey, I'm a member here. And Tiger Woods turned to me and said, why? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome <laughs> i was like oh my gosh he <laughs> can't get his knees cut out from running so <laughs> yeah it's 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 brutal man you hit in the pe- church pews you're done church pews i'd rather be in a church church pews. you can find them there i don't right. want to hit in the rough because in the rough you know, uh, i remember played old mod it was like a week after the the match where remember phil medicine hurt his uh hand i think yeah um, or his wrist? Oh, he hurt his wrist, wrist trying to get out wrist. of. Yeah, I, and I swear to you, I, I hit, I hit a ball. It was number, oh, it was the one. Maybe it was the whole. It was twelve. And it was just roll, hit the fairway, and they kind of, if I remember right, I think it's twelve. That kind of the fairway tilts the right, five, yeah, bit. left to right. You can't, and it just real rolls right, trickles right into the rough. Mm-hmm. Never found that ball. Never found that ball. Yeah. And then the caddy was out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, and then, yeah, you're wondering. What the? What are you guys doing out there? Twiddling your thumbs, huh? 
Yeah. Now I get mad at that. That's laughable. I'm like, come on. That's funny. <laughs> All right. Music on or off on the golf course? On. What do you listen to? Well, that's wild. A variety of things. A little bit of everything. Um, I predominantly, I predominantly listen to jazz. Oh wow, that's good for the, that's yeah, good jazz for the golf will, course. Yeah. yeah, yep. Jazz keeps me keeps, keeps me in the tempo. Uh-huh. All right, l- last one here, Meryl. Uh, most memorable round of golf. Oh, it was first round I ever played with Arnold yeah. Palmer. Oh wow. wow, the king. TPC TPC at Sawgrass. Oh, well, that, that is a memory. Yep. Oh, right. it was a memory, all right. It was my first time ever golfing. And you're playing with uh, Ar- Arnold Palmer. Yep. yep. Just let's just, just put it this way. Arnold Palmer was not happy. No, really? And I, oh, was not happy. Because I replaced Bobby Brewster. Bob, Bob <laughs> called me up and said, hey, I can't play in this tournament. You want to play in this tournament with me or for me? I'm like, sure. And so Dermonte Dawson and I lived together next door to each other and Damani I see Damani out chipping and golfing <laughs> and if you remember Ping had just come out with all these wood clubs you remember those yeah. wood clubs that were like mm-hmm. state of the art and everybody got a pair um a set and you know I had a set but I didn't ever I didn't know how to golf and so he asked me I said he goes you're gonna dress up like Payne Stewart too everybody wears Payne Stewart knickers hat and everything and you're gonna golf with Arnold I'm like oh I am in <laughs> now, you just don't miss that opportunity no. that's that's an experience of a lifetime so I just said, yeah, I go in. He goes, what's, what's the two days I had to go down there. I had to fly down there. So I said, I called him. I said, oh, sure, sure. So I called Dermonte Dawson up. I said, hey, Dirk, I go, um, I got a tournament two two days. Can you show me how to golf? And he, there's, a pause. there's a pause. He's like, Meryl, you cannot learn how to play golf in two days. I said, Dirk, I got two days. I got, I got two days. I go, we're going. I go, let's go. <laughs> so he took me out. Oh, Obviously, shit. I can understand why he meant you can't learn how to do that in two days that oh. was absolutely a train wreck oh man that's all paul wanted to kill me yeah. he wanted to kill me hey well at least you have a memory and uh i'm sure he oh, loved it loved it years oh, after that that well just so you know years later this is this is true some like 10 15 years later some some a buddy that i a, a friend of mine went there was somewhere he was signing autographs okay he was getting an autograph signing and he just said hey he goes um you remember golfing with Merrill Hodge? He said he dropped his pen and he just looked up at him with like a, like a, are you freaking kidding me right now? I'm curious. So like, I'm like, I'm telling you, I'm probably the only guy on Palmer hates. Cause, um, I know, and see, when people go, to, why would he be mad at you? Well, here's why. Yeah. Which, uh, if, if I'm on his side, if, I'm on, if I understood it, I would have been pissed too. <laughs> That was part uh, of the senior tour. The NFL, that Cadillac Classic, had been a part of the senior tour. That's how they made it really kind of a big event. Well, when I ripped off my first tee ball, tee ball, I mean, I pulled it to the woods and I pushed it over. I mean, I pulled it on my left and the right, right? And so he pulls his card out of his back pocket and we're walking together. And he said, um, you're a 12 handicap? <laughs> I said, oh, I said, oh, heck no, Mr. Palmer. I go, shoot, I'm like 12 hole. I go, I, he goes, he goes, we have just teed off, and today you have to play at a 12. And oh. circle the thing, like really ang- – okay, so what happened is they didn't change. They didn't even ask me what my hand yeah, yeah, was. I told them, I'd have told them a million. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> they took bubbies. So oh. They switched out, and since we teed off, because it was a, it was a, it was a, turn- it was a tournament, and it was part of their, um, their tour, I mean, you can't change that. Mm-hmm. That is – He was stuck with me. Oh. That is so <laughs> funny. Like, oh. He's yeah, a, I was like, he's, I, hey, I hated me too. I hey, hated me too. Hey, uh, uh, by the way, I just started two days ago, and uh, here I am. I'm a 12. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't throw that. I, listen, I already knew I was in deep, 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 deep. Yeah, with the king. Deep. Done. Deep, man. Deep. And Gary Anderson was the other golfer. And Gary Anderson was, you know, striping it down the middle. See, he didn't do anything but golf and kick extra points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Training camp. Yeah, like, it's, like a, it's like a pitcher in baseball. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I love he Gary that. Anderson. He was Single, but he's a good golfer. Single uh, bar, yeah, single bar yeah. helmet. Oh, Gary, yeah, he was a good golfer. He was a good, he was a very good golfer. Keep you got mind, man. They had Ar- Arnie's army. I can't even uh-huh. begin to tell you. I can't even begin to tell you how. And I wasn't even nervous because I, I just assumed everybody knew I was bad. <laughs> you know, I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I got there going, okay, these people know I'm not good. Oh. And because you know, Arnie rips one out, or Gary rips one, and then you could see everybody kind of get out of the way, right? And I was like, okay, they, they know. Very good. Yeah, I was like, yeah. good for them. And uh, then he drove, he dropped that. 
announcement on me. I was like, oh, my god, Yeah, brutal. This well, is going to be tough. Those guys, uh, they they know, talking about pressure, like you said earlier, those guys know how to perform under pressure. I mean, these guys on tour now are just so mentally connected. Oh. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But, there is truth, brothers. Well, Merrill, I can't Merrill? thank you enough, man. Uh, oh, you, we pleasure, could sit here and man. chat all day. You you are truly an inspiring individual. You've been extremely successful in your career. And keep chasing birdies uh, on and I'll off the course. I'll be doing it, boys. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, we look forward to maybe seeing you sometime over the next couple of months on the golf course. That's your deal, boys. I enjoyed it, man. Every second of it. Thanks, you guys, Merrill. Good luck. And keep finding a way. All hey, right, amen. Buddy. Yeah, find a way. Amen. Take care. Thanks, Merrill. See you guys. We'll see you. Interesting stuff there with Merrill, huh? Really cool stories. Yeah. I mean, from the time that he played college ball. Dude, how about Arnold Palmer? It, like, will not. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm done with him, man. Done with playing. The king said no. Yeah, that's a really cool story. I mean, and, and the cool thing is that somebody like Merrill Hodge, who's in, in the locker room with some of the greatest NFL players of all time, is so enamored with somebody like Arnold Palmer. Yeah, that athlete mentality, man, and finding a way. That's that's really cool. You know, good vibes, man. That's chasing birdies right there. That is chasing birdies. So we hope you guys enjoyed that episode as much as we did. And actually, you know, we're kind of staying on the football we're, scene a little we're gonna bit We're going to keep the football scene going um, with a good friend of the podcast, a good golfer, had a hell of a college football career. And, uh, I mean, but I feel like if I was in college throwing to Larry Fitzgerald, I would have been okay, an okay quarterback. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he was a really good quarterback. But nonetheless... Tyler Palco yep. from the University of Pittsburgh uh, is our next guest, and he's got great stories. The guy is a fiend for golf, and his business career is growing every year, which is great to see, even after football. And um, he loves his golf trips and his member guests as well. So I kind of like the guy. Yeah, I it was it's it's always good talking to this guy. But the more member guests that you can play in. I feel like the more successful you are in life. Buddy, you got like three. You got four this year, eh? I mean, yeah, we, yeah, we got four. Yeah, four on, I mean, on the calendar. I mean, yeah. You never know what the fall is going to bring up. I got to run. The, I got to I gotta get a hold of my wife's schedule and add a few in there like they were already put on the schedule. Oh, <laughs> uh, shoot. That's funny. All right, guys. Thank you again. Keep listening. Keep telling your friends. Follow us on Instagram. Soon to be Facebook. Bash is setting that up. He's going to get that rolling. Oh, yeah. It's right away. Because <laughs> I know what I'm doing. And uh, <laughs> stay tuned for Tyler Palco. Hey, guys. Appreciate the love. Thank you to Simpler Media for, for rolling this production together. And we'll catch you all on the flip side. Take care. Take care.